Okay, we will uh, open up the hearing for Senate Bill 258, and I'd like to recognize Senator Koka. Koka. It's a Polish name, so it's Koka. Koka. Rhymes with Koka, just in case that helps. I, sh I should have known that. I'm sorry. <laughs> yep, Go right Senator ahead, Perkins please. Koka. Nice well, to see you. Welcome to Public Works, and please proceed. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, nice to be here with you guys today, um, Chair and members of the committee. For the record, I'm Senator Rebecca Perkins Quoka, representing Senate District 21, which is the city of Portsmouth and surrounding towns. So SB 258 is a refile of legislation that um, I introduced last year. And um, both years we've, we've had success in the Senate, but we've run into some questions in the House. So um, we brought this piece of legislation back to address a specific situation in my district in the town of Newington. There's a question between um, New Hampshire DOT, the town of Newington, and the Newington Historical Society about how to dispose of a former railway depot. And so what we're looking to do in this piece of legislation is to enable historical societies in addition to municipalities to be eligible transferees. Um, and so that's the goal of the language as proposed. It's been through many versions and I hope that you can find this one acceptable. The city of Newington in this case does not want to act as legal transferee and prefers not to be sort of a legal intermediary. And so um, there are probably other historical properties that are in a similar status across the state, which I think some members of the Preservation Alliance are here to speak to today. But um, the Historical Society is willing and able to take this property and would like to. And so I urge you to um, move out to pass on SB 258 to allow for preservation of this railway depot in Newington and so many other historic and cultural resources across our state. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions, Mr. Chair. Sure. Any questions for the Senator? Yes, please. Representative Barber. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for my question. Um, I have a question in the language here under Section 1A, Line 6, and then in comparison to uh, Roman numeral 2, Section Line 13. They seem to be one line is saying that you're going to want to sell it for whatever price below market value, and then in the next section it says not to sell it below market value. And I'm kind of uh, confused a little bit on how that works and who determines at what point it's under fair market value because personally I don't understand why the state would sell anything under market value. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your question, Representative. So the construction of the language is intended um, in lines four through nine to – sort of define a circumstance under which a property would be able to be conveyed for less than fair market value. So in lines 12 and 13, what we're doing is, you know, sort of pointing to that exception. The public policy reason behind that exception would be, um, as we read in lines four and five, to say that um, there are circumstances in which it would be deemed to be in the overall public interest to transfer at less than fair market value. And so that would be based on the historical, social, environmental, or economic benefits um, of the property. So we're, we're trying to create a carve out essentially between those two provisions. Follow up. Then, uh, so who's gonna make that determination as far as historical, social, environmental, and economical value? Who makes that determination? Sure. It, I'm, I'm sure that um, the Assistant Administrator of DOT is best positioned to speak to the extensive process that um, this small piece of statute is a part of, but uh, that, you know, DOT has significant jurisdiction and discretion to act here, and so they have an existing process that is is quite complicated. We're not seeking to change that. We're just seeking to give the commissioner in line four um, the discretion when you know particular circumstances arise, such as this historical railway depot 
to transfer to, for example, the historical society instead of its hands being tied because it can only transfer to the municipality. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes. Thank you, Senator. Sure. Uh, I'm curious why you decided to give the commissioner this power rather than the long range committee this power, which they already have over at market value transfers. Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, and I think that the question, the answer likely lies in um, trying to find something that works for all parties. I, th I know that the long range committee does have discretion over certain disposals, but I think where we ended up fitting this into statute, um, it, you know, it just, it made sense to have the DOT be the party that was sort of, I guess, acting on that. And the, behind me is Ben Frost from New Hampshire Housing and um, the assistant administrator at DOT. And so, you know, there's a very complicated process and I do too. So maybe they can speak to that in more detail. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator, my question is why in this bill as it's written, and, and I understand the intent, are you singling out just highway and turnpike property rather than property purchase with general funds or fish and game? Why not open it up to property purchase with those funds as well and any other funds? Sure, I, um, it's a very good question as well. And as you know, DOT has a tremendous number of properties. And so we've been through extensive discussions to kind of, um, figure out the best way to limit it. I think that um, the more limited it is, perhaps the easier it is for, for parties to agree to, but I would certainly be open to a change like what you're suggesting. In other words, follow, follow up. Yeah. You would be open to amending it to include other properties other than highway and turnpike funded properties? I would. Whether the other folks in this room would agree is a <laughs> separate question. Yep. Okay, good. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Representative Mills. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm a little concerned as to why normally if something like this comes before us, it comes with the town of Newington's total blessing. Uh, and it, specifically on line 14, it says, if a town, city, or county decides to resell the property, it shall first off, offer the property to the state at market value. So there, there is some specific language already that we we as a committee shouldn't be handling this directly on the state level. It should be taken care of through the town first. Uh, thank you for the question. And there are, um, again, folks here to testify from Newington, but part of the reason we're in front of you is um, that we have tried through various avenues to convince the town of Newington um, to just merely act as an intermediary in this, um, and they are are not interested in that option. So I believe, and again, I don't wanna um, speak over the experts behind me, but I believe that the town, you know, essentially has first offered the property. And then um, if this sort of situation arises where there's sort of an exception that fits these criteria, historical, social, or economic benefit, um, you know, that those are the situations in which we'd sort of consider transferring to a third party besides municipality. Follow up. Thank you, Mr. Jerry. Yeah, because the way this sounds is this is this is a bill that is specifically designed around one simple piece of property, and and it brings no benefit to anybody else. And the fact that the town, we're we're not usually in the position that we override anything that a town would have jurisdiction over. If if they wanted to do this, and and when people want bridges named, when they want city parks named we always make sure that the town signs off on it first of all, and it's with their blessing, and then we'll go ahead and consider it. So I'm just gonna tell you, I'm having a hard time considering overriding the town's interest in this. Thank you. Sure, and if I may just respond, I, I completely understand your opinion. Um, and I think the intent here is not necessarily to be overriding the municipality, but rather in cir circumstances where the town is not interested to have another avenue. Representative Faulkner. Yes, thank you. I want to preface this by saying my understanding of what this does, th this just adds something. There is a paragraph one in the current bill which stays there, which says that if there is surplus property, surplus highway property, 
it's offered first to the municipality. And then paragraph two says, if it, you know, if it goes to the municipality, municipality, it will pay fair market price. What we're inserting in is at one A, which would be, you know, be, you know, if one doesn't occur, because you have to offer to the town first, if that doesn't happen, then they can sell it at lower the market value if one of these other situations applies. Uh, in, in which case, paragraph two doesn't come into into play because it's not the municipality. So I I, I think we're missing, if, if we had reprinted paragraph one, I think it might be a little bit easier to understand. So I think we're, the relationship between 1A and 2 is, there isn't any other than to accept that out. Okay. Um, Rev. Chabart. Uh, in section two, or Roman numeral two, uh, it says if the town, city, or county decides to resell the property and the intent is to sell it to the historical society, is the historical society owned by the town, city, or anything like that, or is it an entity upon itself? So I think there's two um, two separate items there, if I may, Representative. So yes, I think please. <laughs> it's a really simple subject. So if um, in lines 14 and 15, I think that's concerning if the municipality was the transferee, which in this circumstance, we're asking that it not be um, separately. Your question was, was the historical society owned by the town or city? And the answer is no, it's a private nonprofit entity. So um, I think lines 14 and 15 would apply to the town. I think what we're trying to do is have um, lines four through nine apply to the private entity. Representative Newman. Yes, th thank you. Thank you for taking this question. And I will preface it that maybe it's my reading of it or punctuation, but going back to uh, line six and seven, the subject property may be disposed or leased at less than fair market value, comma, as determined by the governor and council. Is the determination by the governor and council as to whether it be disposed or leased or to determine that it's at below fair market value? That is a very good question, Representative. I, I believe that is intended to modify less than fair market value because it's the you know, I think it's the commissioner that has the discretion to exercise the exception. Um, but I can look into that and make sure I'm speaking correctly. Okay, just follow to, up, to follow up on, I guess, on that fine point. So I'm, I'm trying to get my, my head around it. So it's determined that it's at less than fair market value, but there would have to be some documentation saying the value is here. And because now it's, considering being conveyed for this, now we know it's below fair. How, how do you confirm what what it is? Sure. And um, thank you. If possible, I'm likely going to defer that question to DOT because I'm, sh I'm sure that they have a process for determining the market value, like an appraisal when they go through <laughs> this process. Um, so I think the intent here again is just, it's to add some discretion for the commissioner in circumstances where you know the town does not want the property um, and there is another transferee and they can come to agreement with DOT um, but they are not the municipality okay <laughs> if I could of course chair so the process at present, so this property, we're talking about a specific property. So this property is is an old train station. Is that what this is? And yes, land and associated with it? Yep. Okay. And it's state owned at this point in time? Or did the state, it's state owned? The parcel, right, is in DOT's ownership. Yep. Okay. So if under normal circumstances, Someone, the it was determined that this was going to be disposed of. There was someone saying that they wanted this property, and they would ask the state to consider selling it. Goes through a process, it has an appraisal. 
groups come forward and say whether, and they usually don't do that unless there's a group that comes forward and says they want to purchase that. And the process would be then first it would be offered to the town. It might be, and there's a, a, a group of, um, of parties that might have the first shot at it. And then it would be offered to the public after that. Has there been an appraisal on the property to start with? There must have been an appraisal. I can ask DOT about that. I, I, I will let him confirm, but I believe I just heard him confirm that there would normally be an appraisal, yes. So I, I, there, there's language in here that I, I'd love to become more comfortable with this because when I first heard the conversation, I believe you said that it was for historical or preservation purposes. When I read when I read line uh, four and five, it talks about an overall public interest based on historical, social, environmental, or economic benefits, or is for a non-proprietary government use. That seems like a lot broader language than what I heard the introduction for, which was for historical and preservation. Um, I'm sure you didn't craft this, but you, what, what can you, it, it seems that if we were to pass this, that this is a pretty open book as to, um, I have no, what, no idea what social would be, a social interest. I have no idea what um, an economic benefit or non-proprietary government use. Can you help me with why that language is such? Sure. Um, <laughs> and you're right, Chair, I did not, Crafted, although I did add historical into it, um, the way it came back. So I think that we would certainly be open to narrowing it. The intent here was that if we're, you know, I think if we're going to go to the trouble of sort of everybody understanding the process and creating a carve out that um, we make sure we capture properties that might have other benefits. I, I cannot myself really think of other ones. You know, I think of things like... Um, in Portsmouth, we have the albacore, you know, like sitting on some land near the highway. I don't, that's probably falls in the category of historical as well, but it's just, I think there's sort of examples where, it, you know, if DOT felt like it would be helpful to have a little bit broader language, the narrower, then we could keep this. And if you guys are not comfortable with it, we could narrow it to historical because I'm sure that covers most circumstances. Okay, thank you. Any further questions at this time? Yes, please, Representative Melvin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you. Could you tell me the size of the lot? I'm sorry? Could you tell me the size of the lot? Um, I cannot, but... Thank you. <laughs> Any further you. questions? And we'll have opportunity with DOT, please. Representative Edgar. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks for taking my question. Sure. When we heard this bill before, I believe one of the questions that was brought up is, is it, if in fact something happened, let's say you did give it to the historical, we did transfer it to the historical society, they go and they increase the value of the depot or whatever, and then 10 years from now, they go defunct. Um, how do you determine what the value of the property is at that time? Does it take into consideration you know, how things were improved, and then how could we uh, be assured that we would basically get our, get the property back in under what conditions? Sure. I Thank you for the question, Representative. I don't think the intent is to make sure that the state can get the property back, but I believe, and, and again, I'm going to have folks that are way closer to this process on a day-to-day -day basis confirm, but my understanding is that, you know, if the DOT were to convey the property, it does so subject to historic preservation covenants. And so the deed would be restricted to the uses um, that the exception was granted for. And so that would factor into the value. So for example, you know, if the historical society receives the property, the deed says this property can only be used for historic preservation, they improve it. They can't just sell it again, you know, on, on the market. They sort of, they have to act pursuant to the covenants in the deed. And so those purposes would restrict the use. One second. Yes, follow up. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I guess what I'm getting at more is, or I'm trying to, but, yeah. and that is, is that if 10 years from now, let's say the, the value of the property has gone up, they decided they put a lot of money into it, but they it still now is going defunct. How does it go back to the to the state, and is there any potential claim for that the, uh, the property's been improved, and now, therefore, you know, uh, as far as trying to settle on the uh, value of the property, and there's not a claim that it's been improved, and now because you're getting three times as much for it that that, that they should get some. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you because your question just prompted a, m a memory of mine from speaking about this earlier. And again, DOT can confirm, but there's a reversion clause included in the conveyance from DOT. So um, I'll, I'll have to let the assistant administrator speak to the circumstances under which that would take effect, but there is a protection for the state for it to come back under certain circumstances. And we did look at drafting something into this bill last year to accommodate that very circumstance. And in the end, I think, um, at least on the Senate side, the legislators were comfortable with what the language DOT provided that we didn't need that. Um, so maybe they could, he could cover that in more detail for you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Representative Kaczynski. Yeah. Did you have a question? Representative. Oh, Newton, I, I, I apologize, Representative. I thought my hearing was bad. Yeah. No, uh, thank you, your, thank your, you, Mr. Chairman. chairman. I apologize. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Senator, for taking my question. I want to expand just a little bit on the chairman's questioning. Uh, line five, it says, or economic benefits. Could you give me any kind of a, a specific example of what you would consider an economic benefit? Yeah, it's... Thank you, Representative, for the question. It's a good question, and I, you know, I'm trying to think of um, an example that would fit. One I can think of is, for example, if there was something that would serve as a tourist attraction, you know, like if the if it wasn't necessarily a historical property, but rather a parcel that could be conveyed that would bring economic benefits through additional tourism coming to our state. I, it's not what this is crafted to cover. And so again, if you guys feel this is too broad, we're certainly open to narrowing it. But um, but I, I think that's sort of the intent, something in the public interest. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, we're gonna have an opportunity to speak to others, but please go ahead, Representative Boger. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <laughs> Hopefully my last question. That's fine. Um, it was spurred on by the other representative's question. If the town, city, or county decides to resell the property, it shall first offer the property to the state at the market value. But you stated also that the historical society is neither of the above. So they would not be a party to that agreement, and then they could actually dispose of the property any way they wish after they've received it. Is that correct? So, yes, and that's um, what I was trying to explain to Representative Edgar. Um, there is there's a reversion clause that comes with the conveyance in the deed, and I, I'm going to have to ask DOT to speak to this in more detail, but under certain circumstances, the property would revert back to the state. And um, and again, we looked at trying to protect the state's interest because it would not fall under lines 14 and 15 in this case. And and again, this, the senators were comfortable. We didn't need that. But you may determine differently. <laughs> thank you. Seeing no further questions, Senator, okay. thank you. Thank uh, you guys thank you very much. Time. And I'm going to go back to the chamber. Thanks, guys. Um, I'd like to bring forward Adam Smith, New Hampshire DOT. Perhaps maybe we could clear up some questions here, please. Mm -hmm. And we'll accept your testimony, but we'd like to get to the questions that were concerning DOT after that, perhaps. Sure. Turn it on again. Turn Turn it. Red button, there you go. Thank you for having me here today. Um, so I'm Adam Smith. I'm the assistant administrator with the Bureau of Right-of-Way. I'm standing in today for Steve Labonte, who couldn't be here today. Um, the department wishes to remain neutral on this bill. 
Um, but we're here to provide some general comments and to answer some general questions today. Um, so let me let me start off by saying uh, at the January 31st, uh, 2023 meeting, Steve Labonte made a uh, statement uh, talking about DOT and the Bureau of Right-of-Way. And the, the fact is we're the real estate group for DOT. So we have appraisers, we have surveyors, we have right-of-way agents, and then we'll have property managers that are responsible for disposals of state interest after projects are built. So it's kind of the cleanup or the disposal of remnant pieces, pieces that are no longer needed for department use at the end of projects. So as drafted, the proposed legislation, it would open avenues for the department to dispose of properties for less than fair market value. Um, the exception that is created in this, um, in this RSA 439C um, is mirrored after language that's in the Code of Federal Regulations. Uh, if you want that citation, it's CFR 23710410. And basically that speaks to the um, exact language that was put into this draft bill, which I believe our office, our department helped craft some of that uh, language. Um, that speaks to the, the social um, um, yeah, the social um, piece of that uh, legislation. I'm looking for the exact language. Bear with me. Line five. Line five. Thank you. Yeah, so the exact language, historic, social, environmental, and economic benefits, um, that's directly out of the CFR. So um, just wanted to clarify that real quick. Another thing that Steve Labonte said at the January 31st meeting uh, hearing was that this legislation, if adopted, is not going to be a blank check to sell properties for pennies on the dollar. We still have a responsibility to balance uh, the department's specific obligations. We have a lot of money that is given, obviously, for federal highway uh, development. And if it's not used for that, we still owe that money back to the federal highway. So, um, you know, it's got to be used and discretionary. So we we want it. We want to kind of uh, be very careful how this this would be uh, deployed. So if the if this bill is passed, there are several things that would have to happen for the department to go forth and actually execute uh, selling property less than fair market value. One of the first things we'd have to do is we'd have to amend our right away manual, which is which is uh, it's reviewed every five years. It's approved by Federal Highway. And basically, it's our playbook of how we do uh, do business for the department. And specifically, if we're going to be selling property less than fair market value, that process and that rationale has to be outlined in the in the right of way manual. So that'd be the first thing we'd have to do. Um, and that's no small that's no small feat. We have been working with groups like New Hampshire Housing Finance over the last few years to see if there's any. Um, agreement on potential language that could be used um, to help with that justification that would be approved by Federal Highway. We have reached out to Federal Highway a couple times and gotten some buy-in on um, on some language. So there is there is some groundwork that's been done. Now, the specific situation was um, properties that would be suitable for um, workforce development housing. Um, not necessarily what we were talking about before with the uh, sale of uh, historic properties like the Newington Depot. Um, so there are scenarios uh, where the department could um, transfer property to third parties. Uh, another scenario, we have uh, mitigation properties. They either have wetland mitigation restrictions or historic restrictions. And then those are to offset project impacts. Those are then held by the department. The department struggles with being the steward of those properties. So we're always struggling with that. So oftentimes we're approached by conservation groups that want to take on those stewardship responsibilities. This legislation could help 
paved the way to transfer a piece of property to a conservation group for those stewardship responsibilities and be actively managed. So getting to how we would do it after the right-of-way manual uh, would be um, amended, we would still anticipate going to long range. We would still obviously go to GNC. So the process for disposing of surplus land would remain the same um, and it would still be vetted in multiple la layers. So I, want, I just wanna kind of lay that groundwork that it's not just gonna be a blank slate to sell property less than fair market value. It's many checks, many checks and balances. Um, on top of that, we're going to put covenants and restrictions on the deed. Sometimes a reverter clause is important, um, especially if we're selling something, say, to a town with historic restrictions. Um, that property is sold with those conditions for a very specific purpose. So if that purpose no longer um, is needed in the future, um, we want to make sure before it's sold off, say, uh, for a different purpose, that that referter kicks in and that property is offered with a new appraisal back to the department. So in summary, the proposed legislation, um, it does offer some management options uh, for disposing of uh, challenging properties, I should say, for the department. Um, but the, the, the goal is to um, make sure that it's in the overall public benefit. So uh, with that, um, I'm open for questions. Thank you, and uh, if I, if you would indulge me to go first here. So at present, um, the is there an appraisal on this property? Yes, so there a is. A hundred thousand dollar property is this? A... Yeah, um, there is an appraisal. I'm not sure that's public information at this okay. time, uh, but we have. Uh, a staff appraiser in the Bureau of Right-of-Way has conducted a, an appraisal. Um, they valued the property with historic restrictions and without. So we actually have two values. Um, okay. Obviously, without restrictions garners a higher value. Okay, so I'm fine with that. So at present, if, uh, if we went through the normal process, it would be offered to the town first. So if the town, what's, what's the restriction on what the town would have at present, not with this document I have in front of me, what would the town, would the town have to pay market value? Yes. The way the current legislation is, is fair market value. So there is no exception as written to that rule. So that, that even applies to towns. So in, in the, the way it is right now, the town could say we want to purchase that property because we must, do we have an, who do we have the obligation to on this property? Is it yep. Federal Highway or who do we have the obligation to? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Who, who do we have the obligation to pay funds back to for this property when it's sold? Uh, is this, it, is, this is 100% Turnpike property, okay. so the funds will go 100% back to Turnpikes. Okay, thank you for that. So let's say your legislation passes, the Sanders legislation passes. The, pro the, the, the commissioner and long range uh, come to a determination that they're gonna sell this for a lesser value for some reason that I can't even begin to understand on that explanation I heard for social. And then at some point in time, as one representative's mentioned that this use doesn't make sense um, I have a historical society in my town that we turn property over to, and then five years later we have it back, except now we're spending the money now to, to bring this property back to a, a sellable feature. It would only make sense that there's going to be a substantial improvement made to this property, but for some reason, some, let's say I'll use another word out of here, economic reason that use doesn't continue, but am I wrong to assume that the, that the state has to buy it back then at the market value? So in a sense, if the worst case scenario happened and the state were to transfer this property over to some entity and at some point in time that entity can't make a go of it, 
and then we're subjected to market value, we may end up even buying a property back for more we sold. Am I missing something there? Representative McConkie, no, that's exactly how I read this current legislation. Um, under lines 14 and 15, um, basically, it clearly says if the city, town, city, county decides to resell the property, shall first be offered the property back to the state at the market value at the time of sale. So that could be pretty far down the road. That could be a much different value at that time. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Yes, uh, Representative Jack. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for uh, thank you for coming. Uh, if we were to pass line four through nine as it is, uh, I don't find anything in there that uh, requires it to follow the existing long-range process, as you've said that you would, but there doesn't seem to be anything to require it. Number two, it seems to change the appraisal process from the way we normally do it now, that either your department does it or they have an outside appraiser do it, to the governor and council determines the fair market value and not the appraisal process that we currently use. And I don't see anything in, in the uh, language about covenants that requires a reversionary clause. And is that your normal process? What's the, what's the authority by which you would add a reversionary clause on a sale now? Yeah, that's a good, that's a great question. Representative Jack, thank you for the question. Um, right now, the authority is to um, be able to put conditions on the sale to protect the state interest under this uh, current statute. Um, and then there's some, there's some other general um, statutes um, that the department uses, and I, I can't think of those right off the top of my head, but they're general enough where we, if we feel like there's a, um, a, a need for carrying forth restrictions, say it's a, a mitigation property, and there, there's covenants that run with the land, we would have to offer those with, you know, as a package deal to whomever wants to purchase those. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Representative Faulkner. I'm sorry to get back to this one thing. Paragraph two does not apply to any, I mean, by, by its own wording, does not apply to anything that's covered under paragraph 1A. It says, except as provided in paragraph 1A. So this whole thing about the city having, selling it back to the state of market value only applies to paragraph one, which is if the city accepts it at full market value. And Anyway, paragraph two doesn't require the state to buy it back. It just gives the state the, you know, first option to buy it back. If if it's if it's sold to the to the town under paragraph one, at full market value, if the state wants it back from the town, it doesn't have to take it. But if it does, it pays full market value at the time. That's all that says. None of that has anything to do with one A, which is a totally separate category, and one A provides for its own resale value through the covenants and restrictions. Is that, is that the proper reading of this statute? Yeah, Representative Faulkner, I believe, I think you explained it well. Thank you. Yes, Representative Newton. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. Um, could you give me an approximate of how many properties the state owns that this law would affect? Is it one property? Is it 10? Is it 100? Is it 1,000 pieces? Representative Newton, that's a great question. I don't have the exact number in front of me, but it would be um, it would be a, a fair number. I don't, I don't have an exact number at this time. Follow -up yes, follow-up. Yes, follow-up. Um, and it could be yes or no <laughs> questions. Does the state till, still get land through eminent domain for the highway? and uh, federal and turnpike projects. And is some of that land that's not needed or not used, does that, can that then be sold for economic benefits? Representative Newton, yes, the answer. The answer is yes. The department one, does one, secure one, one last more. question. Yes. It seems to me not too long ago, we just passed a constitutional amendment that doesn't allow for land to be purchased or taken by eminent domain for economic benefits. So how would that apply to our Constitution if you just said that that land can be sold once it's been taken for economic, uh, for, uh, pop, pop, yeah, for domain 
to be sold for economic profit. Thank you for the question, Representative Newton. I think I misunderstood your question there. So uh, the first part of your question was, does the department acquire land through eminent domain? The answer is yes. That's for um, project development, highway purposes. Um, when the project is built and whatever remnants are left over after the project's built, then there's a separate process um, that uh, we go through in order to determine the market value and uh, the conditions that we're gonna sell those surplus properties back to the public. So it's not always, um, it's not always at an economic gain, I guess, uh, you know, especially, especially after a project's been built. So uh, oftentimes they're, they're remnant pieces after the project is built. Yeah. Thank you, Rep. Sam Bogart, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for taking my question. Um, I'm gonna go back to after understanding Roman numeral two, disqualifies is disqualified as of any significant purpose whatsoever based on the fact that 1A trumps it. And I presume that uh, all sales of excess land would then be fi followed under 1A. So with that being said, there's no clauses or anything for, for, and what I've heard, only towns and cities and stuff like that are able to sell it back to the state. But in this case, the one property is, is none of the above. So how does all that fit with this? Because I'm kind of confused now between Help me to understand, please. Yeah, I, I think that's a great question, Representative Bogart. Um, I don't think I'm probably the best person to answer that question. That's a pretty technical question that I would want to table until we had a chance to internally discuss that. Further questions? If, if I could follow up on um, my esteem, that this were to, um, to pass, through the house and to be voted. Then there's a whole nother layer, if I heard you correctly, then you're gonna to have to get the feds to agree that, um, that you have the ability now on a rewrite that you can dispose of properties for less than fair market value. And uh, I think you say that you look at that every five years. How far, how far, how many years are, years out are we that you normally would have done that? Representative McConkie, that's a great question as well. We are about uh, year four. So we're actually in the process of reviewing a right of way manual okay. right now and coming up with proposed uh, changes. And I, I guess this would be something I, I tell my committee not to indulge in, but I'm, I'm going to ask you a would you believe. This, this committee deals on a um, on every other year basis, uh, the highway fund. And we're struggling, struggling, struggling to pave roads. But one of the, one of the and bridges and keep the infrastructure working, but, but one of our crown jewels to date has been our turnpike system. Our turnpike system is uh, self-funding, uh, roads are in good shape and so forth, but the turnpike system is under tremendous, um, tremendous peril because a lot of our turnpike was funded and improvements were funded on, on uh, tolls and uh, and there's pressure uh, to remove those toll booths off of that. And that translates to less of a revenue um, and requires the turnpike system to work even more diligent. If I understand correctly from one of, one of the um, conversations here that this may not be a one-off, this might be many. Can the turnpike sustain giving away property for less than market value and, and still maintain a system that we enjoy? Representative McConkey. So first off, um, I don't believe if this legislation went through that it would be many properties that would qualify to go through at less than fair market value. 
Okay. So I really don't see turnpikes uh, being targeted for this type of legislation. Um, I think turnpikes, uh, you know, uh, they have a lot of uh, a lot of properties that are currently being used, and there's a high demand for those. So even past projects uh, that were um, uh, that were um, contemplated are still on the books and we know there's a high value for that property. So we, we're not necessarily open to selling those type of properties at less than fair market value. Thank you. Any other questions for gentlemen? Yes, Representative Newman. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And you said a lot of words in your question that I was thinking but couldn't formulate as well as you did. So with, with that, um, if I can go back, I, I have this vision in my head of Union Station in Washington, D.C. Okay, it's an active railway station. It's a depot. It's a main tourist attraction, and there are restaurants and shops and whatever in there. So I, I don't, I cannot visualize this property, but it's a apparently historical train station, probably very well located center of town area and on an acre or so of land. So if this legislation passed, would that prevent, just for an example, of a developer coming in saying, hmm, I can keep a facade and it will retain its historical value, but they or whatever the corporation would be willing to pay a big amount of money for it to put it, turn it into, for example, some kind of housing, luxury condos, whatever, and that money could go into the turnpike system. Would that all be prohibited if this legislation as written passed? Representative Newman, I'm not sure how to answer that, that question. That was, that's a good question. I don't have an answer right. for you. Thank you. Uh, any further questions at this point? We have several other cards. Thank you, sir. All right, thank you. Uh, for the senators that are here for the second hearing uh, relative to Hilton Park boat ramp, I apologize. We're having a spirited conversation. I could see that we could be running a half hour late before we get to you folks. I would like to recognize um, Ben Frost, please. Ben, welcome to Public Works once again. Microphone. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. My name is Ben Frost. I'm the Deputy Executive Director and Chief Legal Officer for the New Hampshire Housing Finance Authority. And I'm here to express uh, New Hampshire Housing's support for this legislation as passed by the Senate. Uh, there have been uh, lots of really good questions here, and uh, appreciate Mr. Smith's uh, very adept answers to uh, most of them. Um, I do want to point out a couple things, and this is reflective of some of the questions I've heard uh, from you uh, to Senator Perkins Quoka and to Mr. Smith. Um, with regard to uh, line five, um, that's the historical, social, environmental or economic benefits. So Mr. Mr. Smith pointed out that does come from the uh, Federal Highway Administration and he gave you the CFR citation to that. Um, I heard, Mr. Chairman, you expressed concern about uh, the, the breadth of that and not knowing exactly what is meant by social and uh, I certainly understand that. If you were to seek to limit the scope of this legislation, I would strongly encourage you to uh, include affordable housing as a purpose for sale by the state uh, of surplus property subject to appropriate covenants. Uh, under RSA 204D, which is a surplus land statute, New Hampshire housing has what affects, is effectively a preemptive right to acquire surplus property from the state. That is, we jump ahead of city and town interests when it is for the purpose of development of affordable housing. And I think, I don't think anyone in this room has, hasn't heard that we have an affordable housing crisis in the state. Um, 
So I strongly encourage you to keep that in mind. Uh, we do have, we have an excellent relationship with the department uh, and we have uh, ongoing uh, discussions over uh, surplus land that the department intends to surplus. And we, they give us an opportunity to look at those properties and determine whether we, New Hampshire Housing, have an interest in acquiring those properties for the purpose of development of affordable housing throughout the state. So it's not, we're not talking about one town. We're talking about the entire state, wherever DOT is surplusing property. Most of the properties we have no interest in uh, because they're just not suitable for affordable housing development. They're not suitable for housing development, period. Uh, they may be in commercial zones. They may be strips of land that only the abutter would be interested in. Uh, so we're, we're highly selective in, in uh, choosing properties that we express interest in. Um, with regard to uh, things like the reversionary clause and uh, the, the, the conditions that the department may uh, put on the transfer of property, keep in mind, and this has already been uh, said, but I want to reemphasize this, this still goes through long range and GNC. The department, the commissioner, does not have the final word on this. You effectively do and then followed by GNC. Um, I'll stop there. I put in for two minutes, uh, but I'd be happy to take any questions. Oh, I think we'll take you for more. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Frost. I appreciate you being here. Um, I will, um, so at, at present, when property's being disposed of, it's your understanding um, that affordable housing is, it, <coughs> can make a claim on a property before the town can? Is that what you said to me? That is correct. Okay. And at present, if it was determined that this was a project that was agreeable for affordable housing, you would be conditioned presently to pay the market value of that property? In most circumstances, yes. Certainly where uh, highway funds or turnpike funds are involved. That is, that okay. is definitely the case. All right, I I understand. But if we if you want to add if if someone wanted to add you in the list for getting for less than market value, you'd be happy with that also. Is that what you well, said? Well, we we would because uh, to develop affordable housing on land that is acquired at full fair market value is difficult, if not in some cases impossible. Uh, the ability of the commissioner in effect to negotiate with New Hampshire Housing on what a discount might be appropriate, recognizing that the property would then be used for affordable housing with long-term restrictions on the use, uh, then I'd say that that is a, in effect, a social good. And if I could, I, I would imagine you've probably How many units of affordable housing do you think that this is possible to um, renovate, do whatever? And would you would you be would someone that wanted to turn, wanted to make affordable housing there be hindered by an historical designation? Uh, Mr. Chairman, those are two separate and distinct questions. I'll, I'll address the first one to the extent I'm able. Um, we don't know all, um, there is, a, I assume, I assume a, a public listing of state-owned properties. Yes, there is. Uh, but uh, it's many thousands of properties, and most of them uh, we would have no interest in. Uh, there are some parcels of land that DOT currently owns uh, or controls on behalf of the state uh, that would be really suitable for affordable housing development. And it might be on a particular parcel, it might be 50 units, it might be 100 units, it might be 20 units. It really depends upon the individual parcel. I'm, I'm speaking of this, this, this piece of legislation is starting out as a targeted piece of legislation for the, for the disposal of one piece of property in this town. I'm speaking of that property, is it? I, I have no knowledge of that parcel. Of that parcel, okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, questions, Mr. Frost? Yes, Representative Bogart. So, 
DOT has oversight of property. Is it the property that's already been paid for, or is it property that has been bonded, sold, or purchased via bonds and stuff so that the state is still paying for this land and then sell it for less than what we are paying for it, if we're still paying for it? It's kind of like a multi-level question there. Uh, Representative, I, I assume we're not talking about the individual parcel in which is the town of Newington. Newington. Uh, I, no, I'm not because this generally. is this is more general than one piece of property. So that's why I'm asking. My understanding is that this is only that is the the statutes we're talking about. Uh, this RSA 439C RSA. Uh, 440, which is the general surplusing of land statute, uh, that deals with properties that are already owned in fee by the state. Uh, they're not sub. They're not a purchase and sale agreement. It's not a not a condition of acquisition. It's property that are already owned by the state, and hence that's that's where the the surplusing, uh, the concept of surplusing comes in. They are deemed to be surplus uh, for the needs of the state. Thank you. Any further question? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to bring um, Lulu Pickering. Am I correct about that? Please come forward, Newington Historical Society. Uh, could I also bring Jennifer Goodman from the New Hampshire Preservation Alliance up to ask, uh, make some comments and answer any questions you might have? I haven't done a pinging card yet, but I thought it might be a little quick. If you, if you could afterwards, please. And ladies, if you could do your best to, if, if something's already been um, uh, spoke of or to contain, I'd love to hear everything you have to say. But if you can contain the conversation some, I would appreciate it. Okay. With that, please. Um, Welcome to Public Works. Thank you very much. And I won't go through the... Uh, information that I put online under Thank the you. remote because I think there were so many questions today and I've been involved in this process for five years so I can help give you some information that I think will be very helpful. Um, this legislation is not meant to just be for the Newington Railroad Depot. The reason we're here is we ran into a particular state law that became very difficult for us. And so we said, well, everybody shouldn't have to run into this brick wall. Um, if there's a reason to amend the law, then we should do it so all of the nonprofits benefit. The questions about the language in the bill itself you're right, the very top of this language is an exception. It doesn't modify all of the other ways that property are declared to be surplus. It does not modify whatever the Long Range Planning Commission does. It does not modify anybody's authority on state properties for the market value. That's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to say that in certain circumstances, exceptions should apply. Now, I think it could help you a lot to understand how we got into the situation we're in today. This property has been owned by the state of New Hampshire for well over 70 years. It was taken by eminent domain when the General Sullivan Bridge was built. So what the state wanted to do, I'll try to talk into the microphone. I'm sorry, I'm did sure. you say seven years or 70 70. Years? It has 70. been owned for Thank 70 you. years. Okay. What the state said it would do when it took the property by eminent domain was it was going to create a public park on the Newington side of the bridge, and then it created Hilton Park on the Dover side of the bridge. Hilton Park got created... The Newington Park never got created. That's what the Newington Historical Society wants to do. Now, the property itself is state-owned property. By state rules and laws, it's supposed to be maintained. It's in deplorable condition. Now, everybody knows money's tight. 
highway, turnpike, they have a lot of red listed bridges, they have to decide how do they prioritize their money. Well, historic preservation's not high on that list. And so the next thing I'd like to say is when we came to the General Sullivan Bridge and this massive expansion of the highway through Newington, through Dover, and on the bridge, the Federal Highway, the state, the DOT, said that they were going to preserve the, federal, the General Sullivan Bridge for its historic value as mitigation of all of the other impacts that the highway was having on our area. They didn't. They allowed the bridge to further deteriorate. They came back 15 years later and said, now we want to destroy the bridge. So now we have two properties, state or, f or highway owned properties, supposed to be maintained, were not maintained, and we like historic preservation. We want to preserve one of the oldest parts in the whole state of New Hampshire for public use. So we go through a long and protracted Section 106 process. The language that you see at the beginning of this bill that talks about, I mean, it's the questions you've had, uh, that talks about um, what are these historical, social, environmental, or economic benefits? All of that language comes out of every environmental impact study that the highway has to do on any project that it has. It is an integral part of the Section 106 process of how do you then mitigate an adverse impact on a historic structure. So we're not trying to coin new phrases. We're trying to say, work with the language that everybody understands, that they're routinely doing these studies anyway, so that they can understand what those mean. So the end of the Section 106 process, what I can share with you. <laughs> Now the state and DOT want to destroy the General Sullivan Bridge. We were successful in saying, if you do that, we want you to help preserve the railroad depot property, which you have owned for 70 years and done nothing with. It was a difficult negotiation. To get through that process is not easy. But we got through the process. And the property was go it was assessed. It was determined to be surplus property. It went through the whole long range planning commission plant system. So it was decided, yes, this is surplus property. We can use it as a mitigation factor for the General Sullivan Bridge. So the offer, after four years of very hard work, the property would be transferred at no cost to the town of Newington. It would come with $150,000 because the building has left rotting in place with very little maintenance. It would come with a building assessment to say, here's the priority things that you have to remedy uh, on the building and the approximate cost. And it would come with a land survey that shows where all of the shoreline setback uh, things are, where the invasive species are. All of that was the offer. Now, for the first two years, the town selectmen were very much on board, very encouraging. But selectmen change constantly. We now, in the last three years, have three new selectmen on a three selectmen board. We've had four new selectmen in six years. Their priorities change. But what we heard from them, and this is not unique to us, what we heard from them is, we have too many historic properties already. We don't need another one. 
that's happening all across the state of New Hampshire. That's not unique to us. So if the public entities don't want to work with the properties to fix them, the state didn't, DOT didn't, Federal Highway did not, the town says it's more than we can handle, but you do have nonprofit organizations who are public, they're public in the sense they provide public benefit to the people. We're a private organization because we're incorporated. But you can't be a 501c3 organization unless you have a public aspect to what you're trying to do. We want to preserve the building. It will come with a whole series of preservation restrictions. It's a historic building. We will have to satisfy all of the Secretary of the Interior standards for how you deal with the historic building. We already have been working with fundraising, with grant organizations, working with groups like the New Hampshire Preservation Alliance. Um, we want to do this. But the only thing standing in our way to do something that the state has not done for 70 years, DOT doesn't want to preserve historic properties. The only thing standing in our way is what the exception to this bill is supposed to solve. The language that says that the property can only be transferred to the public entity, the county, the town, or the city, completely bars us as a nonprofit organization from accepting what is a beautiful offer that we've worked five years through a Section 106 process to bring to the table. So we were told, no, nope, if the town doesn't want it, you can't have it. We have to sell it. Now, I think if we want to preserve things in New Hampshire, we want to help with the budget. We want to help with the highway. We want to help with all of the roads and bridges. But we also have to do what we can for all of these cultural, social, historic, housing, the things that benefit people. We need to do those too. Um, and so I guess I'll say that's my rant. I thank you for listening to me. But I'm very happy to answer any questions. And Jennifer is. And maybe I could just give 30 seconds and then turn it back to Lulu if you have any questions. So for the record, I'm Jennifer Goodman, the executive director of the New Hampshire Preservation Alliance. Um, so just wanted to offer a statewide perspective from a nonprofit historic preservation group. Uh, really encourage your support of this exception so that properties like the one that um, Lulu Pickering just described could be helped. Um, kind of knitting together what other people have said, I think um, these are surplus properties, kind of the orphans in the system, um, and there'll be a, a special group where there's um, the right kind of actor, the right kind of nonprofit, if this exception moves forward, the right kind of property um, that will even seek this kind of exception. And then as others have said before me, there'll be a very rigorous process to evaluate whether that exception can be made, what the value is, and these restrictions that will run with the property into the future. Um, I, I can think of, I don't have an inventory for you, but I can certainly, I, I welcomed Mr. Smith's comments about properties like this Newington Depot that have been kind of left stranded after a mitigation process where they were saved as part of this mitigation process for the public benefit, but then they haven't been stewarded um, because it's sort of not in the wheelhouse for the state. Um, so I can think of some other historic, a couple of historic farms over my 20 years at the Historic Preservation Organization that would have benefited from this kind of exception where a, a willing nonprofit could have stepped up and and made that kind of investment and benefited the community around it. Um, 
So again, just there's, there's certainly always going to be pressures to keep the coffers as full as possible um, in those highway funds. I think this is a unique group of properties that if this exception would go forward, would really benefit the communities that they stand in. Um, and as you know, I think um, nonprofits in some cases are often very well positioned to take on this kind of effort. They have um, a narrower focus, a narrower mission, better positioned with the right kind of expertise and access to philanthropic or other dollars to make these kind of a win-win situation. So I just wanted to offer that context. Just push the button. We're live. Thank you, um, Madam Pickering. The did I did I hear you say that a number of years ago an agreement was reached with DOT to mitigate some of the um, some of the um, closing um, from the from the General Sutherland Bridge, which is a near and dear property to my heart. Yeah, the. And that the the DOT was going to turn that over to the town of Newington for a dollar or for zero funds. And if that was the case, why didn't your folks step forward and say, I'll take it for nothing? Uh, there's two different processes that took place. In 2007, when the first uh, work started on the expanding the highway, the Spalding Turnpike and the bridges, there was a Section 106 process that was done. And the conclusion of that process was that the state DOT federal highway were supposed to save the General Sullivan Bridge so that it could be used for this uh, recreational people access across the river. Then you have to fast forward about 10, 15 years, and they came back with a supplemental environmental in impact statement that said, no, it's too expensive now, way too expensive, we can't do it. When we started the Section 106 process, it's, well, show us what you did to maintain that bridge in the 12, 15 years that you were supposed to maintain it, and almost nothing happened. And I think the reasoning is, why put money into an old bridge? If you let it sit there long enough, you can make a valid argument that it costs too much to fix it. Now, is that good or bad? I don't know. But it's how the system works. I understand that. <laughs> I understand that, and uh, this committee's been very involved to discontinue that bridge. I understand. The but I thought there was mention at some point that the town, through the federal highway and through DOT, had offered that property to the town for a dollar. Did I hear something? For no, free? Uh, no. The, with a with one hundred and fifty thousand dollars to help you preserve it. Why didn't Why didn't the town take it then when they were in agreement and then turn it over to you folks then? We have actually made the request both to the town of Newington and to the DOT to say if you if neither one of you want to maintain and preserve this property and the the Historic Society does, 
will you accept it and turn it over to us, give us all of the responsibility to maintain the property? And they said no. The town said no because they thought that, well, you can still come to town meeting and ask the townspeople to help you fund it. That was one of the things I heard. Um, the planning board didn't want to because it's like, hey, if it goes into private hands, you can, ta the question about can you get more property taxes from a private owner that could develop it into something, yes. So there's a financial incentive not to preserve a historic property. DOT said no. We said, well, if the town won't transfer it to the historic society, will you lease it to us long term with all of the responsibility? And the answer we got to that is that they're already so far down this process that they don't want to have to backtrack on it. Okay, I, I just want, I want to narrow my, my question back to. I'm sorry. There, at one point, DOT in co-op, if, if I'm wrong, with the blessing of the federal uh, highway, was would have given the property to the town for zero and given you a hundred, given the town one hundred and fifty thousand dollars to to help uh, renovate or whatever to preserve that property. Did the right. town say no to that? The official offer has not been made, but over the last two years, as we've gone through this process, the memorandum of understanding, the section 106 process, there came a point in time when the town was like, no, we're not going to accept it. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll come back to SDOT. Are there, are there other questions for uh, the two? Thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you very much. Could could I bring DOT forward again and ask that question? Yeah. So could do do you have any knowledge or can you get back to us on on that question that the the feds and DOT had made an offer to the town? We were hearing mitigation for other things. Do you, do you know the answer to that, or can you get back to us on that? Am I on? Yes. Right. Representative McConkey, I'll get back to you. I don't know okay. the exact answer on that. Thank, Thank you. you. We'll we'll uh, we'll probably suspend and so we can get that. But while while we're here, I would like to hear from the last speaker, if I could, uh, Mr. Gilbert from um, Newington, New Hampshire representing himself in support of the bill. Mr. Gilbert, welcome to Public Works. Thank you. My name is William Gilbert. Uh, I'm from Newington. I'm a member of the Newington Historical Society. Uh, not really an officer, but I do a lot of the heavy lifting because okay. of my young age, I guess. Um, Ms. Pickering did a great job of outlining uh, the legal steps that were taken. Um, I'm going to tell you about what what the humans felt at the time. Uh, and I want to emphasize that we're not here just for Newington's railroad station. We're here to try to help other historical societies to not have to go through what we went through. This is what we went through. Um, sort of pre-COVID 2018, 2019, there was a lot of enthusiasm. We said, hey, we're going to we get this train depot, which is a very, very small building, by the way. Uh, and it was in mitigation because they're going to do something with the General Sullivan Bridge. A lot of ideas were being thrown out. It's like, hey, maybe we can get some girders and build a little uh, monument to it with a plaque describing the purpose of the General Sullivan Bridge, the history. Uh, maybe, you know, a great place to hold a wedding. Uh, we have lots of archives in the Newington Historical Society about the railroad depot. We could maybe make a little railroad museum on the first floor. Uh, who knows, maybe a little caretaker up above that could, you know, take care of the lawns uh, in, in exchange for, for rent. And things were going great. Under Ms. Pickering's uh, tutelage, uh, there were memorandums of standing. The uh, select board at the time was very supportive of her. Uh, and then comes the spring of 2021, and our three-man 
board, as she said, turns over. We, so we had a new selectman. And in April, uh, we, we were going to have a meeting, and we thought it was going to be a great done deal. We had our state rep was there. We had uh, a representative from DHR was there. And we might have had someone from the Pres Preservationist Alliance, but I'm not sure. Uh, but at that meeting, we thought it was going to be Everyone's going to vote yes, and we got a uniform. We don't want this property. Don't pursue it any further. Uh, there was talk of, oh, shoreline mitigation, fear factors going on there. To say we were surprised, nonplussed, and shocked was an understatement. And that event that happened to us, that is the genesis of SB 258. And I thank you for your time. Thank you. Are there any questions for the gentleman? Seeing none, thank you, sir. I um, I am going to um, I'm going to recess uh, this hearing at this point in time um, to uh, to gather more information. I am not going to be a time certain. I'm going to post it in the calendar. Uh, we still have plenty of time uh, before we have to exec this bill out. And uh, if that's okay with the uh, with the committee, um, I, I think we have more information that we need to gather. So with that, I will recess out of um, out of Senate Bill two fifty eight um, to to a time to be noticed in in the calendar. Thank you. Oh. Chair Morris, welcome. Yeah. <laughs> I thought we went afternoon, it'd be easy. Okay, why don't we, uh, and I apologize for the late hour. Members need to, need a five minute break? Okay, let's, uh, I apologize, Senator. We're gonna give the committee five, five minutes if you could. Thank you.
Um, Senator Waters, um, welcome to Public Works. I'm sorry for the delay that All you right. had to endure, but I would like to open up the hearing on Senate Bill 228 FN relative to Hilton Park boat ramp. Please, thank, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the committee, Senator David Waters, District 4, introducing Senate Bill 228 relative to the Hilton Park boat ramp. So we're now crossing about a half a mile across Hilton Point from Newington over to Dover. Thank um, you. So what this bill tries to address is the deteriorating condition of the boat ramp and the absence of a dock um, where there used to be one in Hilton Park. And um, there, the condition there is that the boat ramp itself, um, potholes, deterioration of pavement, so it's all but un unusable now. And then years ago, there used to be a dock there so that boats could come in and, and tie up at the dock people could fish from it and, and, and so on. And that dock um, deteriorated and was taken down a number of years ago. Now the concerns around um, this is to be good to have a launching place there. Um, you know, in terms of a public launching place on the Great Bay, it's it, either something around here or you go, go, go to go down, all the way down to Newfields uh, down there. So there's real interest in um, serving boaters and fishers in this, in this area. Um, and a number of years ago, we tried to do something about this um, at, during the time when the construction was beginning on all the bridges down there. Um, Dover had a particular interest at that point, too, in being able to get its um, rescue boat, that it would have a place that it might be able to come into a dock and offload somebody onto an ambulance. Um, we also had at that time just the beginnings of the development of the aquaculture in, in, industry and uh, the folks up in that part of the bay thought it would be very nice to be able to bring their boats in somewhere um, as, as well. But because of the construction project, we just had to put that on, on pause because there was so much else going on there and most of the park was taken up with the construction uh, project. So um, that's why we began to re- initiate these discussions this uh, this past year about, okay, now what, what can we do here? Um, the reason we're coming before you with this bill to create this committee is there are some issues which I'll describe. And so the bill says, okay, we need a committee that can come together and resolve these issues so we'll see if we can't get um, the boat ramp repaired and potentially a construction of a, of a dock. The issues here um, are is that that land is owned by the Department of Transportation. And the Department of Transportation, under its fed federal requirements, must sell this land at full market value. And a number of years ago, we had an appraisal, you know, a million or so dollars for that. Fine. You know, that's that's the law. That's what that was what would need to be done. So to whom would it go? Well, fish and game, because they operate the boat ramps around the state. There are two problems with that. One is that if fish and game owns it and operates it, there cannot be commercial activities. So the aquaculture folks couldn't use it. The gundalo couldn't tie up there on the dock either. The second problem if fish and game runs it is that um, they, under their rules, for boat ramps would have to ban parking aside from that of the trailers that are being brought in in that area. And they would have to have someone staff that boat ramp. So, um, and then add to that is we'd need a couple million dollars, maybe maybe more to build, to build the, um, the, build the dock. The, the, the ramp repairs, not so much. So um, it turns out as well, though, that this is kind of timely because there is federal funding. Um, the federal delegation has been, been contacted. There is federal funding for uh, waterfront projects, coastal projects in various bills at this point in time. So the potential is there that the money to buy it and then the money to construct the dock could be secured through federal grants. So what this envisions is a committee that will see if there is a way forward to solve that problem of the transfer of the property and the management of it. One possibility that has emerged is that Pease Development Authority has said, well, we might be willing to take on the management of this. And that would mean that Fish and Gabe wouldn't have to staff it, that we wouldn't have the parking prohibitions, 
and that the aquaculture folks could potentially use that dock. Now, so there's the possibilities. If we have the committee get together, put together a report, look at these things, then we'll see what is what might be possible for it. So that's that's the bill, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Questions for Senator? Representative Beaton. Actually, I got a couple, Mr. Chairman. The first one is something that we do with on both sides of the wall with the study requests. It uh, says that the study shall include representatives of the aquaculture community. Uh, but below that, it says other interested parties. Do you have objection to removing representatives of the aquaculture community? I ask that because every time when we put a nebulous thing into the bill, like representatives of the aquaculture committee, our staff spends days, if not weeks, tracking down who, what, how it should be, and it just complicates. Thank you for your question. I've avoided that problem because note, it's not setting up a committee with members. It says at this point, it's, it's consultation with those folks. So th they would have to not have to ask folks to be members of this group. It's just, I'm listing the folks that they would, cons they would consult with bringing to talk with them. So that's why online you see on, on the line, um, uh, consultation on line 10. Okay. And that's what governs these other folks. So you're going to have DOT and uh, Fish and Game get together um, and PDA, and then they'll consult with the other folks listed on line 10 on. So it avoids the problem you're talking about. And a follow up, please. And can you tell me any other boat ramp in the state of New Hampshire that Fish and Game does or has to staff? Um, go up to the lakes. I'm not sure how actively they, they staffed one down in, in, in new fields, um, but they said in this they, they said in this particular place, because of the nature of that parking situation, they felt they would have to have somebody there to enforce the no parking by others. That's just what they said. So, thank you. Further questions for Senator Waters? If if I could. So it's been a number of years since I was at that property, used to stop there all the time. Um, is And I remember the boat ramp, and I think I even possibly remember a dock. The, is the ramp still in operation, but in poor condition? Is that what your testimony was, or they stopped using the, uh, the ramp? Um, thanks for your question. I, I, I look at that ramp and, um, you know, I think would be very sketchy as to whether it really could be very well used. I imagine that people could try. But they're, they're not actively it using is, it. It is in tough shape. It's okay. in tough shape. Thank you for yeah. that. Um, so we're, we're, not, we're not forming a commission. That makes, I, I will be happy to take uh, more comment. We're not forming a commission. You want to form a study, and the study, as I understand it, would be DOT, Fish and Game, and P's authority, and then your your you would hold public hearings to that effect, and other people that were interested, public wanted to attend, would have that opportunity. Okay, I understand that. Any, any further questions for the senator? Yes, Representative Newton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for taking my question. Uh, this study committee that you want to form to do the Hilton Park, and you say there'd be public hearings, would those public hearings, you imagine them being statewide or just on the seacoast? Well, thanks for your question. Let me just note, it doesn't say a study committee. It says they, these three shall study. Okay, so um, it is a less formal take but that they should organize a process where anybody who wants to come in and they would consult with. And so I would think that would be a fairly open process. Um, since there will be no apps, they will report to us. If there were then a proposal to do something, I would think at that point we would have a full public hearing process. But for this, it's like, please get together and, and see if you can't work work something out that you can present to us and then the legislature could 
take from there? Oh, yes. So I apologize for saying uh, study committee. That's what it appears to me. But it does say in here she'll provide opportunity for public input. Yep. And where do you see that public input happening? Is that what you just explained? Well, th thanks for the question. And, you know, I, I would think that they would uh, hold meetings probably, um, you know, either uh, Dover City Hall or over at uh, PDA. But if you would feel more comfortable in including language to say, um, opportunity for a public hearing, that would make some sense, wouldn't it? Rep, rep, are, mm. are you all set there? Yes, Representative, yes, Representative uh, Faulkner. Yeah, thank you, Senator. Uh, the results of the study, if they in fact recommend some improvement, would you anticipate that we might see that next through the capital budget process or as individual legislation? Well, um, I give them till 2024, June 30th. So they've got a year. And that does kind of tee it up for the, the following legislative section, session in which there would be legislative possibilities, but also capital budget possibilities. My hope is that on this one, that if it looks like the federal funding is there, then legislation could say that we authorize DOT to make the appropriate transfer at market value, et cetera. And then, um, you know, the, the, the federal grant, you know, and paid for by federal grant funding, something, some line like that. And so that my hope is it would not have budgetary um, costs to the state, but that, that just remains to be determined. Yeah. Representative Fadafi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for taking my question. Pull that a little closer to you if you could, Representative. Thank you. I'm not the brightest guy in the world, but I'm just curious. Are we voting to build the stock? Or are we voting to study it? Thanks for your question. You're voting to tell Peas, DOT, and Fish and Game to study, to talk to people, and give us a report. Oh, because up here it says, this bill directs the Department of Fish and Game and Department of Transportation to construct a boat ramp at Hilton Park and Dover. That's why I asked the question. Um, they shall study it. I think, may, are you looking at the as amended or the original? It doesn't say no, study, it's a bill. Yeah. Oh, well that's, I'm sorry. Th thanks for, thank you so much for pointing that out. Yeah. That analysis referred to the unamended version. <laughs> the uh, the original version of the Senate said, darn it, do the dock. And uh, that wasn't going to fly because of the problems I'd noted about authority over the property and management of it. So that's why the replace all amendment said study. But thank you. I, I, I had looked at that before I came in and said, oh, yeah, 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 it's the old one. And I, I'm glad you pointed it out because you I can see why the that. confusion's there. <laughs> yeah. Further questions? Yes, Representative Joseph. Thank you, thank you Chairman. Uh, Senator, so the goal would, the goal to, con to study, would to study the feasibility of constructing the dock and then ultimately transferring the property to maybe Peace Development Authority. Is that correct? To, to manage it? Thank you. I mean, that's, that's the, that would be, that is the possibility that came forward that would solve the problems about ownership transfer and so forth uh and so that's why the bill said you know that's why it includes peas because they came forward and said you know what we we uh maybe we could maybe run this um because they do that kind of thing and they're just across the water um so that when that offer came forward said okay let's study let's let's study and see if, if that if that is a viable option and we'll find out from this study I think they'll probably look at some cost estimates. They'll look more closely at the funding that's available from the federal grants, and they'll they'll let us know what what uh, what we can do. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, and I understand we have another pink card in the audience. If you could get that passed along, so I can see who's looking to speak and what, Andy. Uh, Senator, I'm I'm almost done here. And uh, the representative uh, showcased an item of uh, 
um, qualifications to be a member of this uh, a member of this group. They have you had conversations with Peas Fish and Game, um, and are are they are they amicable to doing this? Yes. Okay. Yeah. This. Uh, thanks for the question. This amendment um, came out of those conversations that Great. fish and game dot thought yeah the, we would it would be good to do something there they said yes and you know there's a lot of conversations getting to this point and uh they said yes this is a good way to go because without without appointments and so forth it seems like uh those those people could get together to have this study without this but i fully understand that if we put this in legislation and you were able to find a way for uh, federal funding or whatever, it would hold much more merit yeah. in, in your process and going yeah, forward. Th thanks for so, the question. Yeah, so I, so I, I commend you on that. Yeah, so. And I mean, so you know how it is sometimes that, it, 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 that the legislation, this is a light touch. This is a very light touch, but it is probably the only way to get this done. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for your testimony, Senator. Thank you. And um, Kathleen, would you like to come forward for New Hampshire DOT and testify at this point? I apologize if you could state your name and welcome once again to DO, uh, to uh, Public Works. Sure. Um, Chairman McConkie, members of the committee, Kathy Mulcahy Hampson, I'm the Senior Hearings Examiner for the Department of Transportation. My honor to appear before you this afternoon. Um, the Hilton um, Park boat ramp area is owned by Turnpikes, um, and I'd refer to it for DOT anyway as a, pro a problem um, property. Beautiful waterfront property um, is a problem for us because it's not what we do. Um, they want to construct a boat ramp um, and a dock. And again, not what DOT does. We would like to see um, another entity that is better equipped to um, manage the property, take it over, and have it for good public use, um, which we're not able to do. Um, we want an entity that can be a good steward of the uh, property and make that work for the public. We're happy to work in with the other agencies and entities to look at transferring this property. Um, I don't know that we'd have a lot to say about the construction of the dock facility, how to best um, construct that and the funds for that, but we're happy to look at the best ways to transfer that over to another entity that can um, make better use of the property. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, Representative Jack. Uh, thank you. Uh, am I correct because this is turnpike owned that there wouldn't be any issue of having to return something to federal highway? Yeah, I don't think there's a return to federal highway on this. Good question. Anyone else? Yes, Representative Newton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for taking my question. This bill does keep the DOT involved with this project, and I'm wondering... Conceptual plans and ideas and feasibility studies sometimes come with a large cost. How much of that can be done in-house? And, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars are going to have to be spent for this study. I call it study committee to go anywhere. Where, where's that money coming from? Um, so it's not within DOT's wheelhouse to um, do feasibility studies on um, construction of the dock or anything or the fishing facilities. That, that's not what we do. So I imagine that would be with fishing game or peas. Um, that isn't what we do. What I envision our role on this um, studying the issues would be to how best to turn over the property to whichever entity is going to take it over. Thank you. Seeing no further questions, thank you. Thank you. I'd like to recognize, um, is it Elizabeth Fisher? Is this a preferred order between the two folks? Okay. Dover, New Hampshire, supporting the bill. Welcome to uh, Public Works. When you're ready to speak, just make sure the... Um, Red light is on by depressing the button up front. 
Thank you. Good afternoon. My name's Elizabeth Fisher. I am a native of Dover, New Hampshire. And as a kid, I spent many, many hours. And actually, as an adult, I spent many, many hours on the Piscataqua River. I'm going to pass around a little picture. Um, please ignore the stuff on the back. I save paper. Um, so <laughs> I want to pass around um, two things. One is a picture of the dock that used to be there, and also um, a uh, article from Profiles and Courage. And many of you, uh, Profiles, excuse me, magazine. Many of you may remember if you've been in New Hampshire for a long time. That was kind of the magazine that came out on a on a monthly basis. I'm here to support this uh, piece of legislation. Um, as I said, I have spent a lot of time on the Piscataqua River over the years, launching in Dover, launching over in Durham, and attempting to launch at Hilton Park with my little 14-foot Merrimack. Um, and in all honesty, if you back your trailer down that ramp um, boat launch, um, you may lose a wheel in the process. Um, but we persevere because we like to sail, and it's one place that we can put um, our boats in. So that clearly needs to be uh, taken care of um, in the short term, if not in the long term. I'm also passing around a little photograph uh, of the dock um, that existed for many, many, many years um, and was used by both people with the Merrimacks. And if you look at the profiles, you'll see that they had these little tiny one-person speedboats. Um, but there's also larger, larger boats that um, uh, would like to be able to utilize that. Um, so I received a phone call from an organization called Dover 400. We, like Portsmouth, are celebrating 400 years of existence. Um, and so they wanted to do something down at Hilton Park uh, and, because that's where it all began. And um, I went down and looked around, and we wanted to do a boat um, uh, tour or a parade, a boat parade. The problem is the ramp is in such condition that it would be dangerous to try and do that. So we'll have to launch those boats someplace else, and we're talking about moving it up to the Dover waterfront. Um, considering the condition, which has deteriorated from last year, um, I reached out to Senator Waters, and I want to thank him for his efforts and his leadership with regards to this to see if there was something we could do short term as well as, as long term. Um, I also reached out to Senator Shaheen's office um, to see, because we know that there was federal money for infrastructure. Um, and so the solution is for these three entities to get together to try and figure out a long-term solution so that there is adequate public access for um, all citizens um, to be able to get onto uh, the Piscataqua, Chico, uh, Bellamy, mm -hmm. and out to uh, the Isles of Shoals. Um, a few years ago, I became a UNH Marine docent, and I lead tours out to Appledore uh, and also up and down the Piscataqua. So I'm pretty familiar with that whole area. And this is a jewel that just isn't being utilized. And um, I want to put my efforts into trying to make that happen uh, the best that, that I possibly can. So I appreciate your support of this study. I think there's some solutions that can come forward. I think the players that Senator Waters has put together um, are the right players. And, and certainly, um, there's the public support within the boating community, both sailboats as well as motorboats, to, uh, um, to use this space. Thank and you. I think are we there, can work through the issues. Are there questions? Elizabeth, I'm, I must say, anyone that would launch anything only 14 foot long off of that into that <laughs> high current area is a person much braver than myself. So. <laughs> well, you do it at the slack tide. <laughs> <laughs> and then you head up river. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Um, last card that I have is uh, Richard, is it Claiborne, sir? Claiborne. Clyborne. Welcome to Public Works. Thank you. My name is Rich Clyborne. I'm the executive director of the Gundalow Company located in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization whose mission is to protect the maritime heritage and the environment of the Piscataqua region through education and action. I'm here today in support of Senate Bill 228. Our organization is focused on developing the next generation of river and bay stewards, and we do that by bringing nearly 2,500 students in third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh grade out on the Piscataqua River 
and uh, introducing them to a new perspective. Most of those kids have never been out on the water before, so when they get out there, they're sort of their jaws hang open because they've never seen Portsmouth or uh, places like that from the water itself. Um, we use a replica gondola, uh, the Piscataqua, which was built in 2011. Um, and we also offer public sales, private charters. And since 2016, we've offered a summer day camp, um, which started out with 12 campers in 2016 and has expanded to 470 in this past summer. And we're looking to be nearly that number for this coming year as well. All told, we routinely sail with nearly 10,000 passengers each year and hope to reinforce the ideas of conservation, preservation, and sustainability when it comes to the estuary and environment contained within the Piscataqua watershed. We conduct approximately 20% of our sales up in the Great Bay, Little Bay area each year. And we travel up from the, the dock in Prescott Park um, and we dock typically at the UNH uh, Estuary and Lab the Jackson Lab in Durham. The renovation of the boat ramp and the construction of a new boat dock uh, at Hilton Park would provide, and this, these are potential benefits, I'm not talking that they're gonna happen, but potential benefits would provide an opportunity for us to expand our education programs uh, in that area and also potentially reduce the costs to schools in Durham, Dover, Lee, Madbury, Nottingham where I live, uh, Barrington, Epping, places like that. Um, so that would afford us another place to be able to, to dock the gondola and um, board students and take them out on the river. The renovated boat ramp and floating dock would also provide an additional site to conduct some of our summer camp programs, um, which would allow us to reach even more uh, young people and help to further our mission. Um, we also see access uh, to Hilton Park from the floating dock and boat ramp as a potential site for holding our, our annual Piscataqua Riverfest, uh, which brings together our nonprofit partners, maritime themed vendors and crafters, musicians, local food trucks, and includes a wooden boat show showcasing the time-honored craft of wooden boat building in the seacoast area, all with the goal of celebrating the rivers, bays, and tributaries in the watershed and bringing awareness of the conservation and preservation e efforts that are related to the waterways going on throughout the seacoast. Lastly, and as Senator Waters uh, pointed out, we do about 20% of our sales up in that area and having a dock at Hilton Park would also provide another place for us to go in the event that we had a medical emergency on board uh, with an adult or even a child. Um, there are commercial docks in that area that we could potentially get to but the issue of getting the first responders out to the dock to take care of the uh, emergency would be uh, the issue there. So having a Hilton Park would allow the first responders to get there and be able to treat any emergencies uh, in a more timely manner. I wanna thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak to you in support of this bill. Uh, any questions for the gentleman? Yes, Representative Newton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for taking my question. I'm, I'm curious, I've been at that ramp at low tide and you can't even hardly get a boat in and out. Could you tell me approximately how, what you'd have to do, the size of the gondola, the length, and how much water you need to be in to even come into a dock? How, how far out would you have to include dredging or how exactly would you do that if it was low tide? Um, so we are, the draft on our ship is two and a half feet, which means that we can go into a water that's about three feet deep. Uh, at low tide there, we probably would not try to tie up to a dock because of the shallow water. We would have to time our uh, comings and goings there based on the tide. Not like in Prescott Park, we have plenty of water underneath the dock, so there's right. not a problem there. But other places that we go, we have to be very uh, cautious and um, prudent with our timing uh, to be able to land. Thank you. Yep. Any further questions? Seeing none, thank you, sir. Thank you. We um, um, I see no uh, further cards for any testimony here. Um, so I am going to pull to a close uh, Senate Bill uh, 228 FN as amended by the Senate. 
and um, entertain. We have the um, we have this noticed as possible executive session to follow, and I would entertain a motion on Senate Bill two two eight FN as amended. Um, I rep I uh, recognize Representative Jack. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move out to pass. Motion by Jack ought to pass. Second Is that. there a second? Second by Mills. Motion's been made and seconded. Discussion? Yes, Representative Noon. I can't. I like the idea of this, but I can't support the bill as written. I think it's kind of vague. Um, it doesn't really say who the authority goes to and what they're going to come up with and how it's going to be paid for or none of that. I, I, like, again, I like the idea, but it's just, it just seems to be too broad and vague for me to support at this point. Okay. I thank you for that. Representative Padafi. Who's paying for the study? The, um, the question is who's paying for the study? They, the persons that are part of that study will fund this, will fund this, this project if there are funds. The state of New Hampshire uh, and DOT is not, is not paying for it as was the testimony that we heard from the department. Okay, so I, th I think I think the vehicle they're looking to do is to convene a group of people and let them have a conversation on how this would evolve. And I, I think the senator has kept it loose that we know the speaker does not want to see commissions where at all possible. And, and I think I think they're trying to pull this together and see if those parties can come to an agreement and see if there is federal funding available out there. And if so, they they could possibly move forward. So are we, it's it's loose it's loose by design. I will are tell we you that. Approving any money in this, or just we we are not approving any funding with this. Re Rep. Sammy, I I'm going to agree with my seatmate. This it is not uncommon to have bills come from the other chamber that are similar to this that are exceedingly loose and throw responsibility on other parties not knowing what they're going to be and um, to come up with construction costs who's running the study who's in charge of it who's going to be part of it it's so nebulous so loose and I understand there may be a few people willing to work together but um, I don't know if there's a whole lot of people that are going to chime in for free and give you the cost of construction of a boat ramp of a dock, uh, particularly where it's located, where it's going to be a pretty pricey operation to do. Um, I just think it's far too nebulous to let loose on its own, even to the point where they, and it still concerns me, if you look at the cover page, it says, as amended by the Senate. The title is not amended. It directs the Department of Fish and Game and Department of Transportation to construct a boat ramp at Hilton Park in Dover. Exactly. The title instructs that as amended by the Senate. So I cannot vote for the bill as is. Representative Jack. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would just point out the title of the bill is an act relative to the Hilton Park boat ramp. It says nothing about construction. Uh, the language you're referring to is in the analysis that was prepared, I guess, by OLS. I'm not sure who prepares those, OLS? I, I do not believe it is. I... We'll, we'll take we'll take comments first, and then there might be an alternative motion here. Yes. Yeah, I would. Representative Newton. I guess this is it's an important enough thing to try to move forward. Uh, you know, could we consider maybe a a study committee or this committee to have one or two meetings if we've got the time and say, hey, can we pull something together on this? That's you know, tighten it up enough to our Liking, I guess, would be my, and if we can't, we can't, but if we can, I think the bill warrants the effort to try to do something. Uh, uh, is the member suggesting possibly retaining? Okay. 
Okay. Representative Newman. Yes, just in the collective wisdom of the senior members of this committee, the, the notes that I took, Fish and Game, DOT, and Pease Development to work together and study what could be done. And then I made a note, study and get a report together. In the past, have any of you all senior people seen anything like this where you've gotten some groups that agree to get together um, and just at least brainstorm what could be done um, and then they could come back with a report on either we need an estimate or you need an estimate or uh, maybe one of their in the expertise of them that they would have an idea of what a new boat uh, ramp could cost. I, I, I thank you for the question. Um, I have not in my time seen a similar piece of legislation that was not committing to the makeup and or a study or what the result would be. Yes, Representative Barr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, it seems that I thought this is just so they could set up and do a study mm -hmm. and they've defined three departments that should work together to create a study and that there was no commitment of money or anything else or even the fact of building anything yet. It's just to create a study so that a report can be issued to all the appropriate heads of states of our government so that they can review this then to see if it's worthy, financially worthy of moving forward or do we just after the study is done, then put it on the shelf and say, thank you, we did the study, and it's not financially uh, relevant to our budget. So I'm confused where all these other issues are, because it just says here in uh, Roman numeral two that it's going to give a study, and it's going to give it to these people, and it's to be studied by X number of people. Thank, thank you for the question. Representative Mills, did you want to respond? Uh, yes, I did. I want to, I want to thank Representative Bogart because that's my feeling on this also. I also have never seen anything set up quite this nebulous. And part of the reason that I'm in favor of it is that, first, A, it doesn't spend any money. It does name the three entities that have to get together. The worst thing that can happen is if the three entities decide, DOT says, I'm not kicking in a dime, but I'm ready to give up the boat ramp. Fish and Game says, I want nothing to do with this. And Pease goes, well, I don't want to fight over who it is. This has got a time-sensitive date on it that says the, the, 24, the end of this fiscal year. That's it. It dies. It goes nowhere. If, they, if they're all interested and want to cooperate with each other, then they come up and said, here's the deal. This is what we can do. This is what it's going to cost. These are the mechanics. Here's the new bill. We need this done rapidly so that we can get federal funds. So this bill by itself, it either it just lives or dies. They either get us information or they don't. So I'm fine with it. Further discussion? Yeah, let's do it. On the, advice of, Jack is on, recognized. on the advice of counsel, I, I withdraw my motion. So we will, will the second second be withdrawn? I will withdraw my motion. Okay. There there seems to be a diverse opinion on on the um, the legislation before us. Uh, I would like to have more consensus. I like the idea of a more study on it or an amendment that might possibly come to us that would clear this up. So um, I, will, um, I will do as we did before. We have uh, no motion before us for, um, for approval of this. I think I'd like to recess out of uh, um, House Bill 228FN as amended, and we will come back at a date to be posted in the uh, in the calendar to further deliberate this, and we'll notice that as an executive session at that time. 
Mr. Chairman, just a question. I believe yep. neither one of these are early bills, the bill we heard earlier. And I believe the deadline is May 11th, according to what the, uh, when I was at the chair's meeting. So I believe the deadline is more at the end of May, right? So we've got till the end of May as a committee to, to work on this if we have a lot of discussion. So just to clarify, Certainly. I'm willing. So look at my question, even though it's an FN bill, it's we got beyond May 11th to do this? I I think it's the end of, I'll admit I don't have the date in front yeah, of me. For later, May 11th, for, May 11th for early, but I know that. Yeah, we'll, 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 uh, we'll, we'll, I will contact the speaker's office to get a, a definitive answer on that. Uh, we are coming, we are coming tentatively for a session on April, what was that? Uh, the last, is a, the end of April, April, I think 27th, the last, I think Thursday in April. I believe it's the 27th. So there, there might be an opportunity for us to, to tag on to that day, or uh, but we'll look at the schedule and see where it is. We'll speak to the sponsors and see if we can get some clarification on both of these bills. Because, Mr. Chairman, is just for everybody, we have had committee meetings after sessions. If the sessions have been short, or depending on maybe if we have a, a, a 1 p.m. session, we could meet in the morning, or if we have a session gets done noon, 1 p.m., we could meet in the afternoon if we have to. And, and we have had uh, lunch meetings. Uh, typically, the uh, freshman legislators pay for the pizza for the day, but uh, <laughs> that we, we have several opportunities there. So uh, with that, um, I'll call this uh, hearing recess. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think, yeah, the more I listen to it, I think we won't be united in the committee on this. Oh, yeah, so but I, I, think I, I think the questions are all valid that yeah. everybody's asking. I really do. Yeah. I, I want to see it happen. Right, yeah, yeah. I right. I mean, I think, yeah, the tw 228, we can, we can amend it somehow. There we go.